Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me for Revelation chapter 4. I want to talk about some of the things we're going to see in chapter 4 before we actually get into the text. One of the things to note is that there are three heavens. And when I say three heavens, uh, I don't want you to panic. I want you to think scientifically about what you learned in uh, earth science, space science. The three heavens are the first heaven is where the birds and the airplanes fly. That's what we, when we look up in the air, that's what we see. The second heaven is outer space where the planets are, our solar system, the stars, uh, that is the second heaven. The third heaven is the heaven where God dwells. The third heaven is where God dwells. And we know that because in Corinthians, Paul's letter mentioned that whether he was there in body or spirit, he wasn't sure, but he saw he was taken to the third heaven, and it was the throne room of heaven. So third heaven is the throne room of heaven. The earth is where Satan dwells. The earth is where Satan dwells. It's also where man dwells, of course. And then under the earth, that's another reference that we're going to see, is under the earth. And that's where the lost souls are. That's where the fallen angels who have been kept in chains uh, until their judgment, that's where they dwell. And then demons, etc., are all under the earth. So in chapter 4, we're going to see a shift in the audience from uh, between chapter 3 and chapter 4. So chapter 1 was a record of the things that John had seen, and that was the throne room vision in chapter 1, where Jesus was among the lampstands. And remember, the lampstands were the churches, and the churches were on earth. Chapter 2 were uh, the second thing that um, John was supposed to write, chapters 2 and 3, the things which are. And those were the seven letters to the seven churches that existed during that time. But we also know that those, those letters were written to all churches, even the churches that exist today. Those letters are for us. Now we're going to see a shift in language. And so we know that there's a change in the audience. The, from Genesis 4 through the rest of the book of Revelation, we see a very uh, Jewish nature in the language that is used. So look for that. Look for those clues that Jewish readers would understand that un, uh, uneducated, maybe uh, unschooled believers would not necessarily understand unless you had studied the Jewish culture. We're going to see titles. Um, The, we're going to see titles that only Jewish people would understand. In chapters 2 and 3, we saw lots of titles that the church would understand. The lamb as if he had been slain. Okay, that's something believers understand because Jesus died for our sins and he is the Passover lamb. We're going to understand all of that. But the Jewish people who are unbelieving in Jesus as Messiah would not recognize that language because they have not read the New Testament. They're only familiar with Old Testament language. So the rest of Revelation is going to be very, very uh, Old Testament in nature. We're going to see a lot of references to Old Testament scriptures. Paul divided audiences into three groups. When he wrote all of his letters, he he spoke to Jews, he spent, spoke to Gentiles, and then he spoke about the church, the mystery of the church. And he made it clear in 1 Corinthians that in the church, there was no Jew or Gentile, but we are all equal in one body. The Greek word for church is ecclesias, and that means the called out ones. We are called out of the world as a church. So we also see a shift in the scene. In chapters 2 and 3, uh, John was on the island of Patmos, and he was writing the things which are uh, during his 
lifetime. So now we're shifting to heaven, and John has a, a vision of a throne room in heaven. It's very important, and I hope you did your homework. I hope you have drawn chapter four, because if you've drawn chapter four and then you compare the things that you learn in chapter four to the vision that you drew in chapter one, you're gonna see some things that are different. Uh, we also need to uh, recognize that there are three other throne room visions from the Old Testament. So when we get to chapter four, we're going to see some Old Testament references to throne room. The first one is in Isaiah six. The next one is in Ezekiel one. And the third one is Ezekiel 10. Isaiah six, Ezekiel one, Ezekiel 10. There are three throne room visions in the Old Testament. And you can compare what you learn from chapter one of Revelation, chapter four of Revelation, to those throne room visions. And when you piece them all together, when you overlay them, you're gonna get a very complete picture of what the throne room of heaven, not necessarily what it looks like, but what it contains. Because we have no eyes to conceive some of this imagery that the prophets who had these visions were trying to explain to us they they're just beyond our comprehension and they didn't have the language or the symbolism to try to explain it to us so it's going to be exciting when we look at those uh, visions but it's going to be even more exciting when we actually get to heaven and and we'll go oh now i know what ezekiel was talking about oh now i get what john was trying to explain so we need to talk about the rapture of the church because from chapter four onward, we don't see the church on the earth anymore. As a matter of fact, we're going to see that the lampstands in the vision of chapter one were on the earth and Jesus was walking among them. Now there's a shift in chapter four to the throne room of heaven and the lampstands are in heaven. So that's why, that is one of the major reasons that people believe in pre-tribulation rapture. Because in chapter one, the lampstands were on the earth, and in chapter four, the lampstands are in heaven. And the lampstands represent the church. Jesus told, that, told us that very clearly in chapter one, so we don't have to guess about that. The church is in heaven in chapter four. And everything that comes after chapter 4 is the tribulation. Okay, so let's talk about the difference between the rapture, which is the catching away of the saints, and the second coming of Jesus Christ. For those who say it's the same event, it cannot be the same event because there are definite details that you have to look at. The rapture, Jesus comes secretly for his own. Only the believers will see him, and it's in a twinkling of an eye. We are caught up together with Jesus in the clouds. We meet him in the clouds. In the second coming, Jesus comes with his own. He comes with his own. We're following on white horses. During the rapture, we go up to heaven. In the second coming, Jesus comes down to earth. In the rapture, there is no judgment. We sit at the judgment seat of Christ, which is for our rewards, not for sins. In the second coming of Christ, he's coming to judge the earth. In the rapture, this is before the great day of wrath. And in the second coming, it concludes the day of wrath. He comes at the end of the tribulation, which is the day of his wrath, that seven years is, is God's wrath being poured out on the earth. And that's and Jesus comes back as a conclusion to that. With the rapture, there is no reference of Satan. No, no mention of him at all. But when uh, in the second coming, when Jesus comes back, there is a mention of Satan. And he is bound for a thousand years. When the rapture happens, Jesus is coming for the saints. And in the second coming, he's coming with the saints. 
The rapture happens in the air. The second coming happens on earth. He literally comes down and his feet touch Mount Zion. During the rapture, Jesus is claiming his bride, but in the second coming, he's coming back with his bride. In the rapture, only those who are part of the rapture will see him. We will see him, but at the second coming, every eye will see him. The sky will split back like a scroll and every eye will see him. When the rapture happens, after the rapture happens, the tribulation begins. At the second coming of Jesus, the millennial reign begins. So there's a definite difference to this. And if you want to read further, I'm going to give you some cross-references. 1 Corinthians 15.50 speaks about the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4.13, Isaiah 26.19, Job 19.25. Now, we're also going to see a shift in purpose between um, Revelation 3 and Revelation 4. In Revelation uh, 2 and 3, Jesus is at the right hand of the throne, interceding on our behalf. In Revelation 4, we're going to see that Jesus stands up. He's fixing to take control. The church is hidden from the Old Testament. It was a mystery that was never even mentioned, but it was revealed. The church, the mystery of the church was revealed by Paul in the New Testament. There are a lot of like phrases because of course there's a lot of symbolism in chapter four. We're gonna see a voice like the sound of a trumpet, the appearance like a jasper stone, like a sardius stone, rainbow like an emerald in its appearance, a sea of glass like crystal, there are more idioms. Uh, there's a lot of references to those who dwell on the earth, or and we, we call them earth dwellers. There's a difference between us, the church, whose citizenship is in heaven, not earth. We're just passing through. This is not our home. But for the earth dwellers, this is where they live. This is the lost. So anytime you see the phrase, those who dwell on the earth, it's a reference to the lost people. We're going to see flashes of lightning, peals of thunder, seven lamps of fire before the throne, four living creatures, one like a lion, one like a calf, one like a man, one like an eagle. Uh, we're going to see the 24 elders. So let's go ahead and jump into Revelation chapter 4 and begin reading. After these things, after what things? After the church things, after the letters to the seven churches, after the church age, after the rapture of the church. I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. Now remember in chapter three, the last letter to the church that we saw to the church of Laodicea, there was a door and it was closed, and Jesus was on the outside, and he was knocking, saying, if anyone will open the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. But the door was closed, and the door was on earth. Now, there's a door in heaven standing open. And the first voice, which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet, speaking with me. Now, we, we talked about that in chapter 1. The voice like a trumpet. It would be an attention-getting sound, not necessarily loud or annoying, but an attention-getting sound. And the voice, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, come up here and I will show you what, you what must take place after these things. So the voice from heaven is inviting John to come through the open door in heaven where he will be shown what will happen. So he is literally being transported from earth, the island of Patmos, to the third heaven so that he can see personally the things which will take place. Immediately, I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. 
And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in, his, in its appearance. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. So we talked about the five crowns um, in chapter one, because when we looked at the elders that were sitting around the throne, uh, we looked at what they did and, um, and what their purpose was. And we looked at the five crowns and I just briefly uh, told you what those five crowns meant. There was the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory, the um, crown of rejoicing, and just off of memory, I can't remember all five of them, but if you refer back uh, to your notes from the other chapters, you'll see the five crowns that are available to us as rewards, and the 24 elders were wearing crowns. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and the thrones I saw, 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Now, when we see the term sitting, that means the work is finished. So for these 24 elders, they're sitting, their work is finished, they're on the thrones, they have crowns, which are uh, rewards, and they're clothed in white garments. Remember that uh, the white garments are the righteous acts of the saints. So they're clothed in righteousness. Out, of, out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of God. So the reason it's so important for you to draw this, if you were going to draw the five lamps of, I mean, the seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, I'm curious, did you just draw five flames? Or did you draw, I mean, I keep saying five, I mean seven. Did you draw seven lampstands with fire on the tops of the lampstands? This is key. Where does the fire come from? He tells us specifically, the seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And we've already looked up the seven spirits of God. Those are the seven spirits that are mentioned in Isaiah 11 and there were seven different spirits and it represents the complete Holy Spirit of God. Well, during the church age, where is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is inside all believers, you and me. And when the rapture happened, the Holy Spirit went to heaven with us. The Holy Spirit was physically taken from the earth. Remember in 1 Thessalonians, he said the restrainer, he who restrains is still restraining today until he is taken out of the way. The restrainer is the Holy Spirit within us. It's us living by the Spirit of God. That's where the fruit of the Spirit comes from. Love, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, uh, long-suffering, self-control, faithfulness. All of these uh, attributes of the Holy Spirit are evident in us. But once we're gone, those things are gone, beloved. We are gone from the face of the earth. Kindness, unconditional love, patience, all goodness, faithfulness, morality, all of these things disappear from earth. It's not going to be a good place to be once the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way. So now we see evidence that the Holy Spirit is in heaven 
that doesn't mean he can't come back to earth and he can't continue to work and continue to lead unbelievers to him. He's going to do that. He is still going to be active on the face of the earth. But literally here, we see that the lampstands are in heaven and the Holy Spirit, like flames of fire, are before the throne. The lampstands with the Holy Spirit are before the throne. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass. Now, this is very interesting because later we find out that there will be no more sea in heaven. No more sea. Isn't that interesting? So, what does it mean that there was something like a sea of glass? If you can just imagine what a sea of glass looks like, it means it's very still. If you can just imagine maybe a lake early in the morning when the sun is rising, it's very, very still. It's also this way at dusk. The lake, the water on the lake becomes very still. And when it's still, it becomes like glass. It becomes reflective. And you can see the, the shoreline, the trees, the clouds, the sunshine, all of that is reflected on the sea, on the top of the water, because it's so still and it becomes like a mirror. And that's what he is seeing. That's what John is seeing before the throne. Something like a sea of glass, something like crystal. Let's go back to verse 3. He who was sitting was like a jasper stone. Like a jasper stone. Jasper was um, a clear, brilliant stone. It's much like a diamond. A diamond in appearance. So it's crystal or diamond are very reflective, very, very bright. And if you think about it, if we are the light of the world, and now the light of the world is in heaven, and God on his throne is like a diamond, and then the sea of glass around the throne was crystal in appearance. What is crystal? It's clear, brilliant, like a diamond. It reflects, so if you can see the sea of glass reflecting the light that is on the throne, then we look like our Father on the throne. We're reflecting the light of him who sits on the throne, who looks like a brilliant diamond, and we are the crystal sea around his throne. Anytime you see the idiom or the symbol for sea in the book of Revelation, it's going to represent a group of people, a mass of people. And here we see a sea of crystal. On earth, we're going to see um, the beast coming up out of the sea. Out of the sea would be like out of a group or a multitude of people. One will arise like a king out of the sea, out of a group of people. But that's one of my favorite idioms here in chapter 4 is the fact that we reflect the light. We are the crystal sea, and God is the diamond on the throne. I just love that. So verse 6, In the center and around the throne there were four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf, and the third creature had a face like a man, like that of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. Now, if we go back to Old Testament symbolism, Jewish people are going to understand this immediately when they see these four living creatures and the, the symbols, the, the lion, the calf, the man, and the flying eagle. When God gave Moses the pattern for camping around the tabernacle, he did, I, I mentioned this in the introduction lesson, but he told the people how they were to camp. Each tribe 
had their own flag with their own symbol on it. And all the tribes were divided into four groups. And the four groups were supposed to camp around the tribes uh, specified, like the tribe of Dan, I think was the eagle. The, let me let, uh, turn to the book of Numbers, I believe, and let me go through those with you because it really is fascinating. The book, uh, let's see, Numbers 2, verse 3. Now those who camp on the east side towards the sunrise shall be of the standard of the camp of Judah by their armies and the leader of the sons of Judah. So um, the, the symbol for the camp of Judah was the lion, the lion. Then they were supposed to camp around Dan. And Dan, oh, I'm going to get this wrong since I don't have my notes with me. Let me turn to the New Testament and see if I've got it written in Matthew. The point that I want to make is that each flag that was closest to the center that were supposed to be the leaders of the um, four, tri the three tribes behind them. Um, one of them was had the lion. Judah had the lion on their flag. Uh, another had the calf or the ox on their flag. Another had the man on their flag, and the other group had the flying eagle. So all four were represented surrounding the center, the tabernacle, which was in the center. Well, remember when God gave Moses the pattern for the tabernacle and the camp on earth? When he gave that, he said, make a pattern of the things which you had seen. Moses had seen heaven, and he saw God in the middle, the dwelling place, and the tabernacle was the dwelling place of God, the tent of meeting. It's where God dwelt so among the people. So God was in the center. Around the four were the four tribes with the flags, the lion, the eagle, the man, and the ox. When we get to the New Testament and we see the Gospel of Matthew written, um, very Jewish in nature, written to the Jews, Matthew Rep, uh, presented Jesus as Messiah, as uh, the lion, the king of, uh, the lion, king of Judah. So that's the way, that was the first symbol that we see in the living creatures. Mark presented Jesus as the suffering servant, the ox. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke presented Jesus as a human being, as being fully human. Remember, he was a doctor, and he was very concerned with the humanness, the human suffering, the human tiredness, the, you know, Jesus wept. Uh, all the human attributes of Jesus were presented by Luke. And then John represented uh, Jesus as God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He presented Jesus as God, and the flying eagle is the symbol of the deity of God, the sovereignty of God. So that's just something to note, just a little bit of symbolism that the Jewish reader would understand immediately. They would recognize the four living creatures. Uh, they would recognize the, the four symbols that were around the throne in the camp of the tabernacle, around the temple of, in the camp of the tabernacle. Okay, so let's read a little bit more in verse 8. In the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings. This is where we get the imagery that angels have wings, but not just two. They have six. If we go to um, Isaiah 6 or Ezekiel, and look at those throne room visions, we're going to see that they had six, two to cover their eyes, two to cover their hands, and two to cover their feet. So um, 
why don't we why don't we turn and read um, Ezekiel 1 let's turn and see what we learn in that throne room vision uh, I have tried to draw these visions and I'm telling you it was uh, very very difficult to draw it it's hard to comprehend what the language even means. It was very difficult to decipher. But in Ezekiel 1, verse 5, within it there were figures resembling four living beings, and this was their appearance. They had human form. Each one of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, and their feet were like a calf's hooves, and they gleamed like burnished bronze. Okay, who else's feet glowed like burnished bronze? That's the same exact language that we saw in chapter 1 of Revelation about Jesus' feet, like glowing bronze, like they had been in the fire. Under their wings, on their four sides, were human hands. As for their faces and wings of the four of them, their wings touched one another. Their faces did not turn when they moved. Each went straight forward. As for the form of their faces, each had the face of a man. All four had the face of a lion on the right and a face of a bull or an ox on the left. And all four had a face of an eagle. So what we're seeing here in Ezekiel is that um, there, were, there was not just one, uh, one face. Of, of the lion, the eagle, the man, and the ox. But each living creature has four faces. And so depending on which side you're looking from, now if, if John is just looking at the front, he's only seeing one face, one side of the four living creatures. But if he were to walk around and get a three-dimensional view, he would see that each living creature had all four faces. They're just facing different directions. So Ezekiel gives us a little more insight. Such uh, Verse 11 in Ezekiel 1, Such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above. Each had two touching one another and two covering their bodies. So I, I misspoke. It was four wings, not six wings. And each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go without turning as they went. In the midst of the living beings, there was something like that that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches darting back and forth among the living being. Now imagine torches darting back and forth. Does that sound like lightning? The fire was bright and Lightning was flashing from the fire, yes. And the living beings ran to and fro like bolts of lightning. Now, as I looked at the living beings, behold, there was one wheel on the earth beside the living beings for each of, for each of the four of them. So each living creature had a wheel. Now, this is where it gets really strange, and I can't even begin to explain it. The appearance of the wheels and their workmanship was like sparkling barrel, and all four of them had the same form, their appearance and workmanship being as if one wheel were within the other. Whenever they moved, they moved in any of their four directions without turning as they moved. As for their rims, they were lofty and awesome, and the rims of all four of them were full of eyes round about. Whenever the living beings moved, the wheels moved with them. And whenever the living beings rose from the earth, the wheels rose also. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go in that direction. And the wheels rose close beside them, for the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. Whenever those went, these went. And whenever those stood still, these stood still. And whenever those rose from the earth, the wheels rose close beside them. 
for the spirit of all the living being was in the wheels. Now over the heads of the living beings, there was something like an expanse, like the awesome gleam of crystal spread out over their heads. Under the expanse, their wings were stretched out straight, one toward the other. Each one also had two wings covering its body on the one side and on the other. I also heard the sound of their wings, like the sound of abundant waters as they went. Now we heard it, we read in chapter one that the voice that spoke was like the sound of many waters. And now we see that um, the sound of their wings was like the sound of abundant waters as they went, like the voice of the Almighty, a sound of tumult, like the sound of an army camp. Whenever they stood still, they dropped their wings. And there came a voice from above the expanse that was over their heads. Whenever they stood still, they dropped their wings. Now above the expanse that was over their heads, there was something resembling a throne, like lapis lazuli in appearance. And on that which resembled a throne, high up was a figure with the appearance of a man. Remember in Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 1 that uh, God created man and woman in the, it was actually chapter, yeah, 126, that uh, the Trinity said, let us make man in our own image. So we are in the image of God. And here we see the image of God is like that of a man. Then I noticed from the appearance of his loins and upwards, something like glowing metal that looked like fire all around. As for you, son of, uh, It had fire all around within it, and from the appearance of his loins and downward, I saw something like fire, and there was a radiance around him. Remember in Hebrews uh, chapter 1, verse 3, it says he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature. Verse 28, as the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the surrounding radiance. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and heard a man speaking. So if we go back to chapter four in talking about the living creatures, we see the more dimensions. There are four faces of the living creatures. Each living creature had all four faces. They also had wheels, which I don't even know how to explain to you. Okay, so verse 8. And the four living creatures, each of them, now here's where we get the six wings. In Ezekiel, we only see the four wings mentioned. But in this verse, it says, each one of them having six wings. And they are full of eyes around and within. Now in Ezekiel, we saw that those eyes were around and within those wheels. And day and night, they do not cease to say. Notice they're not singing. They're saying, holy, holy, holy. Remember that three times. Anytime a word is repeated, it is for emphasis. But when it's repeated three times, it's usually one for each person of the Trinity, holy to the Father, holy to the Son, holy to the Holy Spirit. And he says, they do not cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne. So when the four living creatures begin to say, holy, holy, holy to the Lord God Almighty, then in response to that, they initiate the worship. In response to that, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy, O you, our Lord and our God, 
That's a reference to Jesus and the Father. To receive glory, remember that's correct value. To receive glory and honor, honor is befitting a king. And power represents his sovereignty. For you created all things. Who created all things? Jesus created all things by the word of his mouth. So in the beginning, we saw that God uh, was the planner. Jesus spoke everything into being, and the Holy Spirit witnessed it and blessed it. So you see a picture of the Trinity all the way through Genesis chapter 1. And here, uh, anything that was begun in chapter 1 is sealed up in the book of Revelation, and here we see that he is saying, for you created all things, and because of your will, God, they existed and were created. It was God's will that these things were created. Jesus was the one who created them, and the Holy Spirit witnessed and blessed the creation. Well, beloved, that is chapter 4. That is an explanation of the throne room of heaven, and it's just a glimpse. As you see, you have to layer the other throne room visions in the Old Testament to be able to see a true representation of everything that's going on in the throne room, and there's a lot going on. But isn't it interesting that what we see in Revelation chapter 4 is almost like a summary of um, of the deeper things that the Jewish people would have already known and heard and studied in the Old Testament. So, very Jewish in nature. The language is very, very Jewish. So, we are going to see that this message, hopefully during the tribulation time, the unbelieving Jews will hear the testimony of the two witnesses. They will read the words of the book of this prophecy, and they will recognize that Jesus was the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, and that indeed they missed the rapture, but they have a second chance during the tribulation. And Jesus is God. Jesus is going to uh, preserve a remnant through the tribulation for himself. He always does preserve a remnant. He always warns before he acts. So these who survive the, the rapture, the rapture is going to be an awful day for those who are left behind. And let me just describe, if you've not seen a movie about uh, the rapture, I encourage you to watch so I'm just to see a perspective of what it might be, uh, what it might be like. But in Matthew, we learn that there will be two uh, gathering in the field, and one will be taken, and one will be left behind. And there will be two in bed, and one will be taken, and one will be left behind. And what we see is a picture of people disappearing in the twinkling of an eye. That's the speed of light. So it's going to be here and gone. It's going to be a flash. There'll be clothes. There'll be a pile of clothes left. So if you live with an unbeliever, you will disappear. The unbeliever may walk into a room and see your clothing, and that's it. You're gone. Even more troubling than that is um, doctors who are believers who are performing surgeries will instantly disappear. And there will be people who die on operating tables because of that. There will be pilots who are believers who will be raptured and no one flying the plane and the plane will crash. There will uh, be people driving vehicles that will disappear and, and the cars will run off the road, run into other lanes and cause multiple accidents and kill people. There will be people frying french fries in their kitchen, and they disappear, and the, the grease continues to burn and will destroy their home. 
So if you can imagine worldwide what this looks like when every believer in Jesus Christ going about their daily lives in an instant disappear. In some countries, it will be daytime. In some countries, it will be nighttime depending on, I mean, that just shows the round world that we live on and the different time zones. So regardless of what time Jesus comes in one country, it'll be a different time zone, even in another part of the country. So people will be involved. Some will be sleeping. Some will be eating breakfast. Some will be late in the day. It depends on where you are on earth at the time of the rapture. So some will be flying, some will be harvesting, working in the fields, uh, some will be performing surgeries, some will be sleeping. Uh, babies, children who have not yet reached the age of accountability will disappear. Pregnant moms will suddenly have no baby in their womb. I love the fact that people who may be in the process of having an abortion the baby will simply disappear and there will be no baby to abort anymore. Those babies will be raptured. So a lot is going to happen. There will be a lot of abandoned pets, a lot of abandoned animals. Um, there's going to be tragedy, chaos, and complete confusion and disorder on the face of the earth. Complete disorder. And you think what we're going through now, uh, during the, the time of this recording, we are all going through the shelter in place of the coronavirus. And we have seen how society breaks down when everybody can't go about doing what they normally do. And I'm telling you, this is just a foretelling, just a taste of what is coming in the rapture. This is God's warning to say, get your spiritual house in order. Jesus is coming. He is coming soon. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Are those in your household prepared? Are those whom you love prepared? Have they heard the gospel? Have you shared what is coming so that people will be saved and people will be rescued from the wrath that is to come. That's the message for us today. That's why we study chapters 4 through 22, even though we're not going to be here. We have to love one another enough to share the love of Jesus because time is short. It's shorter today than it was yesterday. The time is nearer today than it was yesterday. So I encourage you, Share the love of Jesus. Be the arms and feet of Jesus everywhere you go. Be the light of the world because there's coming a day when the rapture happens that the Holy Spirit, the spirit of morality and truth, the Holy Spirit that helps us bear fruit of love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, when that is gone from the earth, it's going to be a horrible place to live, a horrible time to be left behind. So love people enough to share the, the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. I love you so much. I pray for you, and I'm so glad that you are participating in this Revelation study. I hope that you are inspired uh, to dig deeper in the truths of God's Word and to chase rabbits that maybe uh, have been laid on your heart as you studied, as, as ideas or questions have popped into your mind. I hope you pursue those questions and use the cross-references that you have in your Bible to, to dig a little deeper and go a little further and know your God more. Know yourself more and the hope that you have in Jesus Christ and then share that with others. Y'all have a wonderfully blessed day, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.